and welcome back to Saturday. I'm Alex, and let me just start by saying I'm sorry to Sean for stealing your thunder on your Slytherin announcement. Uh, one thing I'm not sorry for, however, is the results of the House Cup. I'm pretty sure you are just bitter because you lost and we won. And that's right, boys and girls, I said we because I am in Gryffindor. I finally got into Pottermore and have officially been sorted into Gryffindor House. It was unexpected, but I can accept it. I did, after all, say that I'm very like Hermione recently, and Hermione is a Gryffindor, so I think it works. Cutting right to the end of the book, Quirrell was the bad guy. Who saw that coming? I definitely did not. Uh, I mean, I, I did this time, because I've read it a zillion times, but I did not originally. I was completely blown away. I think uh, kudos to J.K. Rowling for taking me completely by surprise. With regards to Nicholas Flamel, uh, Amanda encouraged you all to keep track of every name mentioned of of every character that's mentioned in case they do come up, because a lot of them do come up. And all I have to say is good luck with that. Um, I don't know if Amanda remembers, but back in high school I actually started a list, and this was after the fifth book was released, but before the sixth. And I just tried listing all of the characters mentioned, including people, portraits, uh, magical creatures, ghosts, pets, and there was somewhere between two and three hundred at that point before the last two books were even released. So. Um, there are a lot of characters and a lot of people to keep track of, and, and just keep in mind, like she said, that everyone could be important. A fan posed a question this week about the Gryffindor matches and whether or not we ever see Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw, or Slytherin and Ravenclaw, or Hufflepuff and Slytherin, um, or do we just ever see the Gryffindor games? And, and although we never attend, to my knowledge, a game that, that Gryffindor is not competing in, um, they do mention it at least once. I can think of one specific time in which a, a non-Gryffindor match is mentioned, and it's in Prisoner of Azkaban where, where they're getting ready to go into the last match of the year. They do talk about kind of the outcome of one of the Hufflepuff or Ravenclaw games and, and how the scoring is going to affect their game. I have two points I want to go into from Sean's video this week, and the first is uh, why did Quirrell not react when he shook Harry's hand in the Leaky Cauldron in the very beginning. If you look back, Quirrell actually was not kind of fused with Voldemort at that point. It's not until after that happened uh, that Voldemort kind of came to live on the back of Quirrell's head. Um, so he was not yet sharing his soul with Voldemort, so I think that's why Harry did not react yet. The other point Sean made was was mentioning the phrase, years later, looking back. And I, it never even occurred to me that that was unusual, but I think Sean has a very good point. There were actually a few times in this that I, that I genuinely thought that Harry was going to die. And uh, if I'd really thought about it or gotten back and, and analyzed that, I, I could have seen that he's not at least going to die in this book. Um, so that was a good point. So I do want to mention that we did add a few layers to the character of Severus Snape in this section. Um, first of all, at the end you find out that he's actually not the bad guy. And... And we do find out there's more to his hatred of James Potter than we originally thought. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, also, in the fight with Quirrell that he has, um, back in, in the same chapter as, as the Quidditch match, um, I noticed that we know now that he's arguing for a good cause. He's trying to, trying to help and trying to call Quirrell out on something that he knows is bad. But he uses very dark language to do it. Um, says things like, you don't want me as your enemy and you need to decide where your loyalties lie. And I think that's interesting that, that he's using something very dark to accomplish what is actually a good goal for us. Uh, moving along, we do go into the forest and meet the centaurs for the first time here. Um, and talking a little about the centaurs of Harry Potter, it looks like they're actually modeled after Chiron, who was uh, a famous teacher to such figures as um, Hercules and Achilles and Jason. Um, he was also very wise, he was also a stargazer, also a diviner. Um, but that's actually unusual. Um, most centaurs in, in Greek mythology are actually very rowdy and, and very destructive. And they're very unruly and violent. And I wonder if J.K. Rowling's centaurs also have that side to them, or if we just haven't seen it yet. Also an interesting side note, uh, Firenze is the Italian word for the city of Florence which is uh, known as the, the birthplace of the Italian Renaissance. Uh, J.K. Rowling actually uses location names and city names and towns for her character names a lot. Uh, Snape is also a town. It's a town in Britain. Um, so that's just something she likes to do. My favorite line in this section comes at almost the very end, and it's, To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Uh, this kind of introduces J.K. Rowling's philosophy on death that she has in this series. And the concept of death is actually hugely significant to this series. Um, if someone were to ask me to, to sum up the meaning of Harry Potter in one word, it would be love. If I had two words, they would be love and death. This is the first time that J.K. Rowling says that death is coming, death is an inevitability. 
but it shouldn't be a source of stress and, and neither should it be a source of fear. Plato wrote, true philosophers make dying their profession. I think that applies here. As long as we approach death from the right way and in the right way, there's nothing to be worried about. Lastly, I want to talk about the single most important concept in the Harry Potter series, and that is love, and the fact that love is all-encompassing and all-powerful. Um, Carol talked a lot about it, and I mentioned it earlier. Um, but in, in Harry Potter, love is actually so powerful, it has a tangible quality. It can actually create kind of a force field around Harry. I think that J.K. Rowling's message here, and it's, it's one that I completely agree with, is that the single most significant thing, the single most powerful thing we can do in this life is to love. Tune in tomorrow to see our, our guest vlogger for this week, and uh, over the next week, tune in to Daily Dose of Harry Potter, and we will embark on Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets.